So um, maybe by way of, of um, uh, disclosure, uh, Dave and I used to work. Uh, our paths crossed years ago in engineering uh, down in Roseville, and uh, he retired in, in um, 2012. Uh, but apparently only on a trial basis, he ended up working for a little bit uh, part-time at Printerbot in Lincoln during uh, 2014. Uh, nowadays, he spends his time in hobbies, uh, seeing what sorts of mischief he can create with a Raspberry Pi. I won't go into detail there. He can <laughs> enlighten us with that. Uh, cooking, gardening, and including a past at being a vintner one year, uh, which would have been very interesting. Uh, and of course, he makes all kinds of stuff with his 3D printer. Uh, his interest in 3D printing uh, inspired him to teach a class on the subject at Sierra College some years ago. Uh, I saw the ad in the paper, and I took it and came away with a little trinket, and it says, where's the, here we go, introduction to 3D printing. Um, and when I was trying to figure out, I've got a list of um, topics for, for presentations, and the 3D print, I was, okay, who do I get for 3D printing? All, all kinds of names come up. And then I'm seeing this thing sitting on the desk. So, you know, I know the perfect person to teach a class or to give us a presentation on introduction to 3D printing. So uh, with that, uh, Dave, if you're there, um, turn, on yep, your, uh, turn on your desktop, turn on your mic, and uh, enlighten us on how to make the things that then we can um, evaluate with the uh, nano VNA. It's kind of backwards, but oh well. Dave, take it away. Okay, so... Um... Thank you for having me. Um, like we said, I've I've been with uh, I've known Greg for several years, and uh, I'm just going to see if I can share a picture right now. Probably not because I, the caveat is I'm new to actually working with this uh, Zoom. As I'm retired, I don't have to go on conference calls, so I uh, I never actually talk to anybody. Anyway, hopefully you can. I don't know whether you can see. Oop. Yeah, you should be able to see that. I think. That's a 3D printer sat next to me printing. And um, basically, I'm embarrassed now because I, uh, I was going to print uh, this, my call sign. Oops, where's my camera? I was going to show you how to print the call sign, but a couple of gentlemen earlier on came up with much better versions of the call sign. So I'm a bit embarrassed, but that's okay. But we'll kind of go over 3D printing. Um, I'll use some of the slides I used from the Sierra College class. If, uh, it's going to be a probably going to take over all the screens. So, like I said, I'm not a Zoom expert, so forgive me for that. And let me go back to oops, Sherry, oop, 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 oop. and Keynote, and here we go. So, okay, so quickly, just going through this. This is one thing that, as you amateur radio people know, or I'm an amateur radio people, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's a quote from Arthur C. Clarke. So I'm sure you've been out working on a handy talkie somewhere or somebody's seen you in your car and they're going, what the heck is that? 3D printing is kind of the same thing. So just this is just fluff slides, but I want to get to the point, uh, Greg asked me to show you how to get into 3D printing. So this is a, a picture of my first 3D printer. It's called a replicator from a printer company called uh, uh, MakerBot. Uh, they were bought out by a big company who makes big metal versions. This is a plywood version. It had two uh, nozzles. I could print two different uh, things at a time. Uh, it was okay till it stopped working and then it became impossible, but we'll talk about that later. So in the news, you've heard about 3D printing. It's been used for PPE equipment, face mask holders, ventilator parts. People are printing cars, planes, rocket engines now to reduce weight. There's somebody in Europe has printed a 3D house. Somebody printed a play castle in their backyards using concrete. You can use it to rapidly prototype products. And you've seen it in TV shows where classic one is the world famous gun that can fire once before it blows up and melts. And also companies are 3D printing organs um, human organs, because this will stop rejection. So they use some of your own cells and they can 3D print a liver. It's still experimental, but it's on its way. So what's available in the 3D printer market? This was just a snapshot I took off, I think, b and H's website. And you can see all sorts of printers. And you'll see most of them are going to metal now. And a lot of them are in 
got cases around them. And the reason they have cases around them is because when you're printing with something like ABS, which is the Lego plastic, everybody's tr trod on a Lego brick and hurt their foot. Well, you can print that, that particular kind of plastic, but if there's any breeze or any little drafts or anything, it tends to cool the printing at the wrong time and you get warps. So most days people start to build shelves around. In fact, the, 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 little, card, uh, the little plywood one there in the middle, the first project you usually print for that is hinges to put some perspex on there. So most printers, like I said, they come from four inch build areas up to 10 inch build areas. I'm only gonna talk about ones you can buy kind of a home use. I mean, the, the commercial ones are unbelievable. There's a new one coming out, which is classed as a hobby one. And it has a, con instead of a heated bed, I'll tell you about the beds in a minute. It has a continuous belt. So you can, you can print continuously. It's like an infinity belt. So as the object is printed, the belt moves and it starts printing the next object and the next object. And uh, the team at Printerbot in Lincoln were actually working on this one before they kind of uh, went bust. And now a company in China called Creality has actually made that machine and is now selling that machine. So I haven't heard anybody interrupt me, so you must all be following. I talk fast, I, I apologize, but we only, I don't know how long I have. So this slide, if you can see it, is my printer family. I saw some other hams earlier on with their printer farms. I only have three printers. Actually, I have four. I'll show you my fourth one in a second. So my first one was the MakerBot, which is obsolete. It was constructed with plywood, had two extruders, which I'll talk about. Um, it did have software to do what we call slicing and the printing. The platform area was 225 by 145 by 150 millimeters, and it had a heated bed. And a heated bed is what you need if you're gonna print ABS or exotic materials like carbon fiber or um, NinjaFlex. And it cost me, I think, about 1200 bucks. I mean, it was, my wife had a conniption fit, but I told her it was my retirement hobby. Anyway, uh, then I went to work for Printerbot, who was closed, but they're restarting up again. And they made all, they, they did uh, plywood at the beginning, but they moved to a metal model. And they tended to have single extruders. They didn't have any software whatsoever. They relied on other people's software, which is good and it's bad. It means that it can be used anywhere, but I heard earlier on somebody mentioning profiles for that uh, device you were discussing. Each printer will have a profile that describes its build area, its, whether it's got a heated bed, etc., the speeds it works at. So it's one of the flexibilities you have. And this one would only print PLA because I did not have the heated bed. That was another option and a bigger power supply. And that one cost me $3.99. And then last year, um, I, bought, uh, I broke down and bought a Creality. Um, it's a Chinese clone of all the other clones, I mean, of all the other printers. They all follow the very same format. The printer firmware on the main board is usually a variation of something called Marlin. This one is all metal. It has a single extruder, one, one thing. There's no software with this whatsoever. And of course, being from China, there's no instruction booklets whatsoever, except a few key, few little IKEA kind of diagrams. Um, it has a heated bed, so I can do ABS and PLA and others, but it has a bigger area. And you'll see the price was 289. And actually it's printing now, and you probably can't, you might be able to hear the fans, but if I was using one of the, my earlier printers, you, you would ask me to turn them off because you would hear the, the stepper motors just whirring away. This one is printing right next to me. It's literally, well, let's see. It's, it's the width of this bottle. Oh, you can't see that one, sorry. Anyway, it's right next to me and it's printing right now. Um, here again are the, 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 the versions of printers that are out there. You'll see they're nearly all metal now. The ones in the middle, Ultimakers, they're from Europe and a lot of people class them as the Cadillacs of 3D printings. They are quite expensive for home use, but they do get a good write-up. And they released their software for that printer, which is called Cura, C-U-R-A. And that's what I use for slicing and controlling my printing. And it's, it's free software, it, it, it's pretty good. The one on the left there called the Ender, that's the current machine I have. The little display on the right hand side is slightly different, but that's my new machine that's printed next to me. And the top there is the, the printer bot ones and the top corner of the play is the small one that I, I originally had. Now in the right hand corner, you'll see the three, 3D Doodler, the world's first 3D printing pen. So yes, you can print 
with a pen or like a pen. Um, you have to remember that you're extruding plastic, which means you're melting plastic, which means that little brass end there is quite hot. But you can actually use the 3D print that doodler to actually 3D print things. I've actually repaired a 3D print that failed with the 3D doodler. So everything's possible. So what can you print at home? So ham radio people, project boxes, of course, Morse code keys, I'll show you one in a second. Um, new tools are adapters for existing tools. Replacement parts for broken stuff. I heard one of you mention that. Signs, yep, you gotta have your call sign made. Microphone stands or microphone clips. Uh, and in other words, whatever you can imagine, you can print. You can make molds for other things. You can make toys for grandkids. And I found this on the web um, from a place called Thingiverse. I did send Greg a kind of a small PDF with several links to where to find everything. This is a complete satellite antenna rotor tracker uh, built with 3D. Obviously the stepper motor inside and the bearings and the various rods are not 3D printed, but all those parts in red were all 3D printed and designed by this amateur radio, uh, Jay Burns. And um, so, as I said, you can, you can do it. So let me just, if I can click back to the camera for a second. Okay, so what can you print? So, you can print a, uh, a lightsaber, which, you know, every self-respecting ham probably needs as a lightsaber. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to connect my shop vac to various power tools. So I'm always making these adapters. Oops, there we go. Now, the nice thing about 3D printing is, if I can show, can you see it? It says vac and it has an arrow, so I know which part goes on the tool and where the vacuum cleaner fits in now. So you can design this into your tool. This is a, another one I made for a tool I got from Harbor Freight. Uh, their hose connector was like a little clip that you, you slide on. So I made this in two parts, black plastic and white plastic, and glued it together till I got the idea. And then I convert it to one solid piece. Oops, where's the camera? One solid piece. And actually I put uh, little, little nobbles on there so I can, I can lift it on and off. Uh, if you've got grandchildren, of course you, you have to print them toys, which this, my granddaughter loved these octopuses. She, she, she talked to me one day over uh, FaceTime and said she wanted everyone in the color of a rainbow. So we had to make some of those. Uh, project boxes. So this is one for uh, Raspberry Pi. Now, the interesting thing about project boxes is You've got to be able to make them stick together. This one has two little clips, uh, one right there, oops, there, and there's another one at this side. Now this, if you just push them, the, uh, the box comes apart. Oop, terrible, this camera. There we go, comes apart. And another thing about making project boxes, apart from these little, these little clips here, is inside here, I've actually embedded brass inserts so now I can screw the circuit board right into those brass inserts just using uh, 2.5 millimeter screws. And the brass inserts, you, you basically make a column and hollow it out and then you put the brass insert on the end of your soldering iron and just push. And as it's plastic, it just melts. So you get the perfect fit there. You can, of course, design screws and print your own screws. Um, if you're into uh, amateur, if you're into Model railways, you can make uh, railways. This is, when I finish this, the, oops, where we go. This will be a wonderful uh, Stevenson's rocket model, hopefully. I'm very good, not very good at finishing things. Another, another challenge for 3D printing is what they call printing in place. So this is one device that was printed in all in one go on a printer. I didn't have to stick anything together to make that. Um, it printed the screw drive inside. As you can see, it's, it's obviously just a, a lift environment, a, a, like a jack. But that was printed all on one printer. And I didn't design it, I printed it. I get most of my designs from uh, Thingiverse or, or somewhere else. One thing that the community's done is, um, this is gonna look a bit creepy, but this is a, oops. This is a hand for disabled children. Uh, that they are born with uh, with no hand. They they end at the kind of the just the wrist area. It's it's very 
I wouldn't say common, but it's to do with the umbilical cord wrapping around the, the limb when the baby's in the, the womb and it, the hand doesn't form. And as you know, kids grow fast and, you know, things like these are expensive medically, but this was printed for, I think it like, not even $15, I don't think in all the parts. So if you can flex the wrist, you'll see, oops, you'll see that the hand actually closes and the thumb closes. And therefore the, the child can actually catch a ball. They can hold a handlebar for bicycle, bicycle riding. And um, this is a, a group called Enable and uh, they print a lot of them. A, you can see there's a lot of wires on here. Oops. And that's how it pulls together. But um, these days they've been enhanced that by using like the Fleximum filaments. I'll show you what can go wrong, but how you can save the day. So for example, I wanted to make a, a Christmas box. So there again, it's just a simple box, red plastic, green plastic, not, not painted this time. But I was printing an ABS plastic and I told you that they get affected by weather, uh, sorry, by drafts. Well, look, look at the horrible wrinkles on this box. Now, as it's a box for Christmas, it just looks like it kind of was wrapped badly. So yeah, so you can save prints even though they, they go wrong, okay? What else? Oh. So have you ever thought of a speaker system? So how about, uh, how about this? This is a mathematically designed speaker for the, one of the original iPhones. You plug your iPhone in here and there's a charging thing, but there's two holes here because that's where the speakers of the original iPhone came out. And then this just echoes you know, the sound round. It's like the, the old Edison horn. So how about a couple of those on your, uh, on your desk? And uh, as you can see, it's, it was actually printed in place and all everything again we'll, we'll cover how to do printing so these are some of the bizarre things you can can print you can print anything this looks like a little whoops where we go this is to show you the details you can get so it's a puzzle box there's two oops, where we go two pieces but, but try and get it back together when you've never well i'll have to do it later now because i've taken it apart but that it, it, you can see how smooth some of the, uh, oops, there we go. The curves are on this, on, on 3D printing. So why you can make such great molds and things. So well, before I, we move on to the next slide, I talked about printing in place. I wanted to show you this mechanism. Okay. This is actually a complete spring and release printed in place. So there's cog wheels and there's a print. And if I, I just have to hold it carefully. If I pop that, you'll see it spring open. So, so, so now that you're interested in 3D and we know that the Morse code keyers need a spring to bring them back, how about designing a Morse code keyer with a complete 3D plastic spring environment by using these gears? So there's your challenge for this evening or your homework, okay? So any questions so far? So shall I... Keep on zooming and tell you how it all works now. That okay. horn is terribly fascinating. This is Brian, AI6US. That horn is fascinating. Uh, so many of us have top firing speakers on our, you know, on our radios. That would be so cool to adapt that to be a front firing speaker, very retro uh, look. That's cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, just, just before, um, I told you the, the first printer I had had two nozzles and I could print two filaments at the same time. So I, I printed this black and white cube. That was the demo cube. I quickly realized that eh, I don't really need two nozzles. I'm okay with one nozzle. <laughs> so anyway. So um, I have a question and I don't yes. know if you're going to get to it, but I was the guy who asked about the repair stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like, are you... I mean, you are, are you going online to get the, I guess it's a CAD file to tell the printer how to print this stuff or, you know, how would you go about um, if you had say a broken knob for an old radio that was really hard to get the knob or a refrigerator in your camper <laughs> or something like that? How would you go about um, kind of mapping that out to be able to print it? Excellent question it, it so happened i was around at a friend's house before covid and we we were playing it was a vinyl night we were playing records and there i saw his stereo system 
he had no volume knob on his stereo and on his receiver. And I asked him, you know, what happened? And he got lost in moving and he never go around to buying one. So first thing is I went online and I just typed in the name of the receiver and Googled it. Google's a great thing and the internet sometimes. And sure enough, I found somebody would already made one. So basically I just, you know, I just printed it for him and it fit perfectly. But I also found other variations of that knob or different knobs um, that I could print. So I printed in two different ones. I printed in one which was just perfectly round and smooth and then one with like little finger, you know, little uh, nobules on. So the other way you can do it is, um, I mean, if you can find the CAD CAM, you're, you're okay. Or if you can find a print, a picture of it, it's possible to take a picture, a 2D picture, and make it into 3D. There's, there's various things on the web you can do in image manipulation. Or you can, you know, design your own. Um, one, of the, one of the sections I cover is kind of tools. This is one of the tools you'll probably need. It's a set of calipers so you can, you can measure everything. And believe it or not, this is another tool you'll need. Oops. That's for getting things off the print bread because they tend to stick sometimes. So you can Google it or you can design it yourself. You know, it, it's, it's easy. Most knobs usually have that D shape, you know, that, uh, so if you can work out the caliber that size, you can, you can do it from there. Okay. Uh, there's, actually, there's another good point to what you were asking. When you're doing CAD CAM designing or any designing of any box now, if you suddenly come across, say you're designing it, you want to make sure you get the right screws. I'll just quickly jump to Safari. Okay, there's a company called McMaster.com. I don't know whether you've ever heard of them, but they sell every known piece of hardware to man. And if we click on um, alloy steel screw, for example, oh, my internet's slow, and we scroll down to this wonderful words here, it says CAD. For technical drawings and 3D models, click on the part number. So we'll click on the first screw, for example. You click on product details where it says the word CAD. And right there is a drop down menu of the various models they have of that screw. And so you can bring that screw into your CAD CAM package and you'll know it be the exact same size that you want. And um, so that's one of the nice handy things. While I've got you on shared, let me show you Tinkercad. Hopefully you've you can all see that screen now. I was redo, redesigning the, the uh, there was, oops. There was the original one I was doing, but you guys embarrassed me, so I decided to make another one much better. Okay, but what I wanted to show you from here is, um, as Greg mentioned, uh, as Greg mentioned, I, I like Raspberry Pis. Say I wanted to make a new case for Raspberry Pi, there is a 3D model of a Raspberry Pi. I know that's a bit beyond what we're talking about, but you can see that's the right size of a Raspberry Pi with the mounting holes. And I can now build a case around that and know that I've got my mounting holes and my, uh, my network and my USB ports perfectly lined up. So basically you can design a box now around that. There's a company called Adafruit from New York and they sell lots of interesting little gadgets. They also produce the similar thing, a, a technical drawing or a library of their products that you could put into um, your own design. Uh, that's a sidebar. But anyway, so uh, let me go back to, oh, sorry, any more questions or are we still okay? All right. Okay. All right, so. This is what my definition of 3D printing is. Simply it's anything that you can design, you can build, and you can attach glue and everything. But where did it come from? That's the key thing. So everybody missed 2D printing, right? We jumped to 3D printing, but we didn't really know we were doing 2D printing. So you've been doing printing for a long time. It's printing in two directions, and we're going to use technical terms as we're, we're experts. X and Y, okay? So for example, on your printers right now, your ink cartridge goes across the X direction and then the paper moves in the Y direction and then the cartridge moves back in the X direction and that's X, Y. So 3D printing means that we got to move in another direction and we call it Y. And what happens this time is that 
we're going to go up in the Z direction. Sorry, X, Y, and then Z. All right, I confused myself then. So here's an example. This is what 2D printing looks like. You basically go X and Y. There you go. So remember typewriters and XY plotters? So basically, all we're doing is adding the third dimension, which is um, um, 3D. We're going to go up in the Z direction. Now, some printers move what we call the print head or the extruder up, and some printers move the platform down. Different ones, different variations. Um, it depends on how the engineers designed it and uh, also where they wanted all the moving parts um, to work. Some extruders or print heads actually have a servo motor in them and some don't. In other words, the filament, we'll talk about that in a minute, gets pushed from somewhere else, unlike my printer. So got to think X, Y, and Z. If you're into uh, CNC machining and a, a thing called G-code, you can actually read the code and find the X, Y, and Z instructions. So I'll cover now What's an extruder, a heated bed, bed leveling, uh, FDM and, or SLA, that's the different techniques you can print. FDM is the plastic I use. SLA is a, is a resin. And um, I'll kind of cover the, the a comparison over that as long as I don't run out of time. Filaments and add, whew, additive versus extra, extrative manufacturing. If you think about, if you do woodworking and you turn on a lathe or a metalworking, you turn on a lathe, you're actually extracting material from the model. With 3D printing, you're actually adding material to, to the model or you're building something. So remember the, uh, the replicas from Star Trek, how you started with tinsel and, and then a cup of Earl Grey appeared. Well, that's the magic of 3D printing. So once again, we're gonna use X, Y, and Z as the axes nowadays. So the, the extruder, or the hot end, it depends how you call it. Basically, there's a, there's a hot piece of metal in there that gets heated up to 220 degrees Celsius and melts plastic. And then it gets pushed through from uh, rollers, which are driven again by a, by a servo motor. And the hot end is what's gonna deliver the plastic in thin beads or lines. Um, it's got a heater and a temperature get sensor in there. And some, like I said, some have the gears in there and some don't. It just depends how they, they design. Um, there are some designs now where you can actually remove the, uh, the hot end and replace it with another hot end, which contains a laser. So you can make your 3D printer into a laser etcher or a very small, uh, like a Ryobi drill. And you can now make it into a CNC carver so they're, they're changing all the time about how they do these things this is an example of a delta printer um, there's a optional heating bed at the bottom on the right there is the you can see the the heating coil in the lower right corner there the block with the big red wires that's the the, the heater block at the top you'll see the servo motor and you can actually just see a piece of red filament going through there and how it's pinched uh, as it goes through. Um, filaments, like I said, ABS is uh, Lego plastic. PLA, that's the one I tend to use a lot now because with PLA, I can print in the house. With ABS, I can't print in the house. My, my wife hates the smell of melted Lego. Uh, PLA smells a bit more like popcorn. There is wood fiber now that's, cut, uh, that's got some bamboo texture in it. In fact, the little speaker at the bottom there is made from bamboo uh, fiber. There's a thing called Ninja Flex, which is flexible. Um, people have produced a better plastic. I think it's called PJEG, I think. I can't remember. I haven't used it yet. I tend to stick to PLA because it's quick and it's easy for me right now. But one of the things that happened at Printerbot was a company in Germany uh, called Procini. They took the 3D printer from Printerbot and instead of a hot uh, extruder, they actually put a syringe in there and extruded marzipan and potato puree and chocolate. And they made a 3D printer for the catering industry where you could design logos for cakes and everything. So you think about it, you can do it. So um, some of you are probably familiar with CNC and CAD CAM machines. Um, all the, uh, the models were, that I 
talked about today are usually in what they call STL format. The file ends in STL, and they're interchangeable. And you can you can find programs that will take a, a, a file from one CAD CAM program and put it into STL for you. Uh, G code is ultimately what gets sent to the printer, line by line, literal instructions: move X, move Y, extrude plastic, and then move X, move Y, extrude plastic, move X, move Y, move Z, extrude plastic. Um, braf, brims and rafts and supports. So when you make a model, as we, as we talked about a box, a box is pretty straightforward. It does know what you call overhangs. Overhangs are where you, you want, like it's, an example is a mushroom. You imagine a mushroom, okay? So you've got a stem of the mushroom and then you come up to the crown of the mushroom. If you made that mushroom model and tried to print it, what would happen is that, that I'll, I'll show you the slicer in a minute. The printer would print, as we said, X and Y and then Z. So it would start to build up the model up, up the stem of the mushroom till it got to the point where the crown is. And in, you know, the crown will be hanging over the stalk. Well, there's no connection there between the crown and the stalk until further up in the mushroom. So the printer, would just start spewing plastic in fresh in, in midair. It would be a complete mess. And I, I've seen plenty of those. So you do what's called supports to hold those things in. Or another way is, to, for example, in the mushroom, and now that I've thought about it, you can turn the mushroom upside down. And as long as that curve of that mushroom doesn't exceed like 45 degrees, you could probably print that upside down without any supports. I know that sounds gobbledygook, and I'll, I'll try to cover that. Um, a brim and a raft. A brim is just to layer a, some plastic around the model you're printing before you really start. And that way you can check your bed is level, your plastic's extruding okay. A raft is used if you're printing something that's got a very uh, thin layer at the bottom that's touching the base. Like think of an inverted pyramid. So the point of the pyramid is like, you know, one little millimeter. You'd probably build something like a raft where there's more plastic to hold that as it went up actually. To be honest, you build a support for a pyramid. Take that example back. But a raft will hold something more. And, and support, as I said, is for anything that's over like 45 degrees, you might want to build a support. Laura, the software will build it for you now. You don't have to worry. Um, you just tell it you want some support. Infill percentage. So most of the models, um, like the box is, uh, well, like the octopus, for example, I showed you. If you, didn't, if you did an infill of 100%, the body of that little octopus model would be solid. And that's a lot of plastic. And uh, you don't want to waste a lot of plastic. So you can reduce that infill as much as you want. If the part you're making is not very strong, you can drop it down to 1% or 2%, uh, sorry, 5 10%. If you want it to be sturdier, you probably want to go up. And if you go up to 100%, then it's, it's rock solid, all plastic. If you are using a, uh, and we'll talk about this, uh, an outsource uh, like 3D hubs or, or strat, um, actually staples, is it staples? No, UPS, to print something for you, um, and you and you and you pay by plastic. And by the way, if you give them a model of a solid, you'd be paying a lot of money for that. Uh, they're still relatively cheap, but you can save money by not having solid models. Shells is is the definition of the. As we said, the model we're going to do is not particular. It's going to be hollow, but you need enough shells to make an outside surface for it. So, and then you infill from that. The watertight model means that um, you you've got to make sure there's no weird holes in your model. It, it's it's a bit hard to understand if you've never done 3D modeling, but if you do 3D modeling and you play with all the little faces and you you click on various things, you can inadvertently makes a model that's not tied together. Think of it like the skin um, is not all the way around the model. And when you print that, you can get some very, very weird uh, uh, things. So the next term I keep mentioning is slicing. So we talked about the model going in the XY, when we print the XY area and then the Z area. So, so how, do we, how do we get a model like an octopus with those curves to go from, you know, into the 3D. Well, you slice the model. So think about it is that every, if think of the, for example, the Z is just like, say, for example, one millimeter tall. So you take the model and at one millimeter, you slice off 
a layer and that's a layer. And then you go up one more, mil another millimeter and you slice another layer. So the printer itself, that G code is printing just one layer going up one level, printing a layer, going up one level, printing a layer. It, it's kind of, think of a glue gun. You've all got glue guns. Well, layer, put a layer of glue down and then wait till it gets a bit tacky and then just put another layer of glue on top of that one and you'll see that you've got a 3D printer. You've just put two layers up and then you can put another layer on top. And it's kind of the idea. Um, profiles, I, I think the, these are, as I said earlier, how you describe your printers and how your printer is going to do uh, the model. There's a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have, know about open source models versus proprietary models. It's the same in the 3D printer world. Um, a lot of good open source stuff out there. A lot of the machines that come from China, people immediately update new, new firmware for them that is available on the open source market. So I'll, I'll pause to see if there's any questions. Okay, so this is what some people call the, the tool path. You might hear it in the industry. It's like, you know, you've got your idea, how do you get it to print? And so I kind of drew boxes around. I like boxes, I like Lego. So you have an idea, you design it, you slice it and you print it. And you can start from scratch with your idea. I, I've done some of those like the adapters for the shop back, you use some CAD CAM software. Uh, then you need some slicer software and then the printer that drives uh, software. You can search the web for the uh, for um, ideas. Uh, there's lots of sites where you can pay for ideas or you can get them for free or send somebody money for a cup of coffee. Some software does a slicing and printing together or you can send it to someone. And I, I heard some volunteers earlier on at the introduction who said they have 3D printers and can print for you. So there's uh, various places. And I said UPS actually prints them. Uh, libraries, Sacramento Library had some 3D printers um, going. The one thing is I haven't mentioned is it's not a fast process. So don't think you're going to go down to uh, the UPS store with your model and it's like a photocopy machine. They're going to put your model off your USB stick in their printer and you're going to go, okay, it's ready. No, it, it's, it's, it takes a while. The, the little call sign that I showed you earlier on took 14 minutes to print. And uh, the longest print I've ever done was nine hours. And I was very nervous. I don't like leaving plastic and machines running for nine hours at a time. Anyway, slicing. This is, this is kind of a presentation of slicing. So we start off with a cube and we slice it. And then we print each slice at a time. Um, overhangs. Um, I'm sorry, I, I made a lot of stuff for my granddaughter. So this was a, a toy. This was a, one of the wonderful minions. What I mean by overhangs is you'll notice these little goggles stuck out there. Uh, this, this software is called uh, Mex Mesh Mixer, and you can put your 3D model in there and it will analyze the overhangs for you. It will tell you where there's weak areas. And as I mentioned, if it's not watertight, it will show you where it's not watertight. There's also little buttons at the side there that says generate support. And so you will, it would immediately generate support for those goggles. Uh, this is another view of that software, deciding which is the best way to print it. One thing, uh, oh, sorry, this, this picture here shows you that same model, and you can see the little green areas are the supports now for those goggles, for the overhangs. And supports, it's still 3D printed plastic, but it's very thin and very fine. And when it's printed, you just snap it off with your fingers or, or a pair of pliers. But the interesting thing to note here is at the top there, this is the Cura software I was mentioning. It tells me that that model will take me two hours, 13 minutes to print. And it's going to take nine meters of um, plastic and it'll weigh 27 grams when it's done. This, this is an old picture of the software. But uh, when I said that I showed you the picture of the, uh, the minion reorientated from that other software, because you're printing you know, layer by layer, there's nothing to stop you printing it upside down, sideways, backwards, as long as you've got the supports and everything. And that's what that mix, 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 who can't say mesh mixer software will allow you to do, will, will try to work out the best orientation for your model. Okay, G code. So just as this is, we all know what ASCII is, 
G code, you can actually read with a text editor if you want to. Um, this is an example of uh, just the G code that I, I did for a model. And you can see the X, Y, Z positions there. So line 26, it's doing an X move of 50, a Y move of 50, and a Z move of 0 0.3. So it's going up like 0.3, I think it's microns, millimeter. I can't remember, can't remember this, this model. But that's before, that's going up one layer. And what it's telling you there in the comments, the, the semicolon is telling you it's doing a skirt. So basically it's drawing a skirt around the model to help it fix to the base. The line 28 tells you again, it's moving X, it's moving Y, but there's an E there now. That's the extruder, that's emitting plastic. And the next lines underneath that, how uh, you can see it's moving slightly in the uh, X direction and the Y direction, and it's extruding plastic all the time, okay? Tends not to extrude plastic in the Z direction because it's going upwards and you don't want to have like stringy bits about. And just as a point of interest in this model, Line 29, uh, sorry, line 26 was a Z movement. And the next Z movement was line 11,337. So that's how many X, Y extruder movements happened before we went up one layer. So you can see these files get kind of big. Words of caution, <laughs> you are melting plastic, 210 degrees centigrade. The heat bed may get warm. Uh, my uh, mine, actually, I put it at 50 degrees even when I'm printing PLA. There's moving parts. Um, servo motors, the only, the only way these motors know to stop moving in the X direction is if you hit the end stop. There's a micro switch at the, the lowest part. There's a micro switch at the X extremity and the Y extremity. If you don't hit that moving part and your hand is stuck in there, it's going to hurt. So, you know, just be cautious. These are machines. And... Uh, I, like I said, I don't like leaving long prints. I never leave a print unattended. I know that's crazy. And you said, you just sit there for nine hours and watch a print. Well, I had lunch and dinner and everything. Anyway, again, words of caution. APS has got a strong smell. PLA, not quite as strong. It smells a bit more like pepcorn, popcorn. Um, they are doing medical studies to see if it's bad for your health. But it's like all your, your hobbies. You, you, you take extreme caution or you, you do it in the garage or somewhere. So let's look at a, a 3D printer, anatomy of a 3D printer. A 3D printer has got four stepper motors, uh, X, Y, Z, and an extruder. Um, some people are coming out designs with the fewer by com combining gears and everything else, but you know, the more complexity is, the more difficult it is. This was the, the printer bot play uh, model and the uh, the X-axis motor is belt-driven. It drives the extruder across backwards and forwards with a belt. The Z-axis is a threaded screw uh, design so that as it turns, the unit goes up and down. Uh, the Y-axis motor, again, drives that bottom plate on a belt drive. Um, the extruder, again, just drives a gear wheel against a bearing that's just spring-loaded so it can pinch the plastic so it can push it through the extruder. The rest of the anatomy is a power supply and electronics, basically, and some micro switches and temperature sensors. And nowadays they come with LCD screens and various other things. My new one has an LCD screen. It's not touch, but I never use the screen for whatever. So getting started, uh, we can skip this one. I think we've talked about most of the stuff that you can do here. As some people do have started businesses, 3D printing, um, you can, I don't know whether you can still do it, but you could register your 3D printer with uh, 3D hubs. And then what would happen if somebody wanted something printing and they live nearby, 3D hubs would connect you and you could uh, print and, and work it out uh, how to do it. So to buy or not to buy, well, again, it's up to you. These are some of the supplies you'll need. Um, the nice thing about the Chinese machine, the, the, uh, the Ender 3, it came with a complete toolkit of Allen keys and screwdrivers. None of the others tend to do that. So you probably need your own set of hex sets and, and everything else. You can build one from scratch. Uh, for example, the PrinterBot team posted all their designs onto, um, I think it was GitHub. 
uh, the big place where everybody puts software. I think all their designs are there and you could build one if you wanted to. Um, there we go. So software. Okay, where can I print? Somebody asked where you can do that. Uh, popular sites, Thingiverse. Um, you can get a lot of stuff from Thingiverse. I get stuff from Thingiverse. Um, there's another one called uh, Yegi, youimagine.com. Um, one other interesting thing is you can scan your own, um, scan things in with your smartphones or your, 3D, or your scanner. There are 3D scanners, and there's actually 3D scanning apps now for smartphones and they will give you a model that you can print. In fact, during the pandemic, um, when it started, one company uh, would uh, issued an app where the smartphone took a picture of your face and then it built the mask for you and then sent you the 3D uh, file that you could print your own mask. So it masked, it, print, it, it, it did an analysis of your face and then built a mask for your face. So I, I read the other day that somebody broke a microphone cable clip they do a lot of podcasting and they broke the clip so what they did is they put the clip on their 2d scanner that you know comes with all the printers these days they scan the 2d image in they put it into some uh, graphic software where they they kind of painted in the bit that was broken they converted it to uh, i think an svg model which is uh, a file which is a, a graphics file you can move around they brought that into a 3d program and then they just selected the surface and extracted the surface up, uh, I think, one, point, 1 or 2 millimeters. And now they had a replacement clip for their microphone cable just done by, by scanning in the broken one. So it's up to your imagination about what you do. Software. Uh, you got to have software. It varies from free to very expensive, uh, easy to use to very complex. When I say complex, if you use CAD CAM programs, then uh, Autodesk uh, Fusion 360, which is a CAD CAM program, will be easy for you. If you've never used one before, uh, it can get boggling in all the, the stuff, but there's plenty of free classes online to, to model software. If you really like numbers, you can program 3D models mathematically in a program called OpenSCAD. And there's a, a definition on the left side of a dice and go for it. it all you software programmers will like that one, but it, it's beyond me. Um, this was Tinkercad, the one I was showing you earlier. And wow, well, look, a model of a dice with actual numbers in. That's pretty easy to do. And basically, if you look in the lower right corner, there's a shape called a dice. So you can easily put the dice in there and make it. Um, program called Blender, which is um, an animation software. It's very, very powerful but it makes 3D models. I mean, you animate 3D models in it, and guess what? If you've made a model, you can click on it and you can download it and print it. Um, again, this is AutoFusion 360. This is it's an incredible program, is this one. You can, for example, this little uh, shell case here, um, it was designed to, uh, for a broken part. Basically, my, it's a fob for a, a gate opener, and I broke off the top piece, so I can model it, uh, in this program um, and I can set the parameters of the measurement so it's exactly right and then I can print a replacement part so you're asking now you could do that this is one way you can do that you can get the software for free that's the nice thing about this it's like I said it's very expensive very powerful but you tell them you're a student or you're a hobbyist and you get a free license so there you go um, Microsoft did uh, release 3D Builder. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't use Windows. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's still probably there, but again, you can see that they've already got simple models to, to, to use. Okay, uh, I think I've covered most of these things. Uh, overhang, solid parts, printers one, fit parts together, glue them, screw them, okay. Um, oh, software, this is... Um, just wanted to show you uh, about support. So this is, if you remember at the inauguration, there was a weird picture of, I think it was Bernie Sanders sat with his uh, glasses on and he's and all wrapped up because it was cold. And I, I found this actually on the web. Somebody made a model of it. Uh, if you notice down in the lower right, this model would take 23 hours to print. So obviously I didn't, I'm not printing this model, but I wanted to show you how it's oriented um, he's kind of laid back because there's a lot of overhangs. If you look, if I put his feet down, 
um, there would be, you know, his butt stuck out and stuff. So this is what the program, oops. This is the menu where I said, select support right there, generate support. And that's what the program did. It looks, it looks messy because it's in the preview mode now. You can only see those supports, but you can see basically all the little lines that go down from his legs and his feet to the base. And they're gonna be printed in a very fine, flimsy uh, filament plastic. And it, well, it easily breaks off and, uh, and there you go. But again, 23 hours is a long time to print. And remember, you, you're printing by melting plastic. And if anything can go wrong when you've decided that you're gonna to go to bed and leave it running, you know it's gonna go wrong. And the worst thing that can happen is that, uh, for example, the Z motor may break or the coupling may break. So either the, the base is not moving down, or you know, in other words, you have zero Z movement, but you're still going X, Y and extruding plastic. And guess what happens? It doesn't know it's not moving and it keeps extruding plastic. And when you get up in the morning, your printhead, if the house hasn't caught on fire, is immersed in, you know, what did it say it was? Three kilograms of plastic. So that's why I don't like leaving them. Um, the other thing too, I should mention, uh, when you're printing, you can print from a computer. Um, I've been printing from some software called Octoprint. I'll show you that in a second. You can print by putting the print model on an SD card and just put it into the printer and the printer can print from an SD card. If you print it from a computer, don't shut the computer off because it's driving over USB, so your print stops. Don't decide to do a software update in the middle of printing because that will probably screw up with the USB, so you'll lose half your, your print will stop. So there's, you know, all those things I've tripped over for various reasons. Um, anyway. MakerBot, this was the software that came with the MakerBot. Um, you put the model on there and you send it off to the printer. It did the slicing for you. And again, it had some controls. This is Octoprint, uh, runs on a Raspberry Pi because that's one of my favorite new toys. The, um, it, this, this only understands G code. And that means that you have had to slice it. And instead of sending the printer an STL file, you send it a G code file because it only understands G code. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, it, this is all open source, but it understands how to stream a video webcam. So you can continuously monitor from your webcam and all sorts of fun things like that. Okay. I'll pause if there's any questions. I have a question for you, Dave. Yeah. When, when you come to the end of the day and you're done, how do you clean this up? Doesn't the plastic uh, kind of sit inside the extruder and get hard? How do you handle that? Also, how do you change from one color to the other in the middle of this, like that frog you showed? Oh, well, let's see. Um, first of all, uh, let's cover the changing of the filaments. Um, what you can do in, in G-code is you can, and a lot of the new uh, software now is allowing you to do this. You can put a pause in the G code to tell it to change filaments. So for example, you'll print so far and then it will stop and you pull out the old filament, put the new filament in and tell it to continue and it will continue on with the new filament. That's one way. If you've got multiple extruders, you just can print two different um, plastics. The problem with the, the two extruders is they've always got to be perfectly aligned. One thing I haven't I'll talk about in a few more minutes is, is bed leveling. If you don't have those two nozzles aligned, one extruder will either when, you know, plow through the bit that's just been printed and it's hot, so it'll just melt it, or it'll be too high and just squirt plastic out that won't, won't match. So that's why I wasn't too keen on the two extruders. They're too much trouble for me to set up. Um, so you can change um, color on the fly. Some other enter enterprising people, um, built, you see, one thing, once you've got a 3D printer, you find out all the things you can print with a 3D printer to make the 3D printer print even better. They printed a small kind of reservoir where the filament went through, and inside that little reservoir, they put the, um, the, the uh, magic marker pens, you know, the, one, the, the highlighters. They put, they put the, that foam that's you know, in there, so the plastic went through that and took on the new color. So that's how some people changed color. Now, uh, the last question was what happens with the filament in the extruder? If you're continually printing, um, you know, 
day after day, it's not going to stick in there. On some of the earlier ones, it was a problem. So what you would do is you would heat up the nozzle with one of those controls to even more than 200, 250, and then you would grab hold of the, the, the bit that's sticking out of the extruder and pull and unplug it. That's about the only way you, you could get them out. So usually when I finish printing, um, if I'm there when it finishes exactly, and usually when a print is finished, it moves the print head away from the model and, and if it uh, uh, moves the model out so you can get it off the, the print bed. Um, if you quickly go to the extruder, then you can, depending on your printer, you can easily remove the uh, filament because it's still wet down at the bottom, you know, still kind of moist in the printer. If you leave it too late, you can again turn on the, the hot end, turn on the heater, and then just pull the plastic out. So that's usually what I do. Uh, if, if I'm going to store it, and I'm not going to print next day, is I, I get it out there. If you do get the hot end really jammed, in other words, you, you, you heat it up as much as you can and you've tried pushing, you know, you've broken off the piece you're trying to pull out. So you, you try pushing new filament in there. Uh, it's, it gets difficult. You may have to actually replace the nozzle um, if it's just the nozzle that's clogged. And in fact, all printers usually come with a replaceable nozzle because it, it's a small brass piece and it's continually heated up to 200 degrees and it, it's brass, it's going to wear out. So you can do that. I actually did free my MakerBot one. I took the nozzle off and I used, it's a four millimeter hole is the extruder nozzle on mine. I got a smaller drill bit and I, I carefully kind of drilled through the plastic, but I had to replace it eventually. Uh, so anyway, hopefully that answered your questions. Yeah, interesting, thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, so finishing prints. Um, ABS, you can use acetone to produce a smooth finish. Um, that's a very smelly project, but what I've seen some people do is to take their model and put it into a jar that contains acetone and leave it for a while and just the fumes, uh, don't, don't put the model in the acetone, you know, put it on a what? a block or something higher than the, the liquid, but the fumes of the acetone will smooth the finish. It's hard for me to show on your camera, on the camera, but you, I'll see if I can do it in a minute. You will see the lines uh, of the layers and, uh, and that's what uh, you can get rid of with acetone and ABS. You, you can use fine sandpaper and you can use model paint. And, and if you've been a model maker, you, you know how to get uh, stuff out of, uh, ooh, I did that again, didn't I? There we go. You know how to get things out. So just as a going back to the printers for a second, um, that box at the top there, that was a, that was a printer bot. Uh, one of the very first ones they did with the plywood, but you can see the four stepper motors in the box there. The one below is a Delta one. Um, just when I was getting ready to talk to you guys, I found out that there's 3D printers out now, which are under a hundred dollars. And uh, they've got very small build areas, uh, 50 by 50 by 50, but you know, they, they can make small things. Now the one there on the right, that's a resin printer. And, and how this resin printer works is that, uh, that that's the build plate at the top and you're going, well, it's upside down. Well, what happens is that build plate sinks right down to that base. And in the base there is some resin and if you handle that resin, you need gloves on and a mask on and everything. And you notice that that printer comes with a case because it's smelly. So what happens is underneath, um, the, underneath the little base of resin is a, a opaque window. And underneath that is a, a ultraviolet lasers or an ultraviolet LEDs, just depending on how they do it. So what they do is they zap the resin just like the, the 3D printers put in the printing, you know, extruding plastic, they harden the resin. Then that plate is stuck to that plate. That plate moves up. And then guess what? They, they go and zap another layer and the plate comes down and picks up the, that next layer and goes up again. So eventually if you built a model, uh, for example, um, well, whatever model, it would, it would be upside down because usually, you know, that's, it, it comes off there. Now, when you've got that model off there, you got to finish it with some stuff that gets rid of the resin that, that's not being fused by the laser. Then you've got to do some other stuff to clean it up. And, um, but those printers now are, they're down at the 200, three, two to 300 range, but they, they only print small. 
But the detail of those are incredible. If you're into like small role-playing game models and you want Dungeons and Dragon characters, this seems to be where that market is. Or if you're into jewelry, they can make very fine jewelry modes. Um, anyway, oh, I, I think I talked about this. Oh, there's my, my, my screen. It's not a touch screen. You, you turn that little knob and step through the menus. I spent, I've, I've used an iPad for so long. My first 10 minutes with this machine, I kept punching those little icons going, why is it not moving? Why is it not moving? So yeah, you turn the knob to make it move, not a touch screen. Okay, um, I think I mentioned where you can go to get things printed, uh, Staples and the UPS store. Um, there's a company called Shapeways and uh, Pnoco. Um, Hacker Labs, uh, it was at Sierra College, but I think they, with COVID and everything, they're just down in Sacramento now. They have at least two or three printers, and as I said, libraries got them. But again, it's a slow process. You, you're not going to whiz in there and, you know, 10 minutes later, whiz out. You, it's got to be planned and booked. And sometimes I think places like the library and the Hacker Lab will get your model and then call you when it's finished, I think. Um, most services will check your model can be printed. In other words, it's watertight. And uh, remember, if you're going to use one of those places, try to make it, your model as hollow as possible. You know, if you were making like a, a rabbit or something, I don't know. Anyway. So I have a love-hate relationship with uh, my 3D printer. Overhangs with no supports we talked about. The model not watertight is an interesting one. This is like all software, an incorrect profile for your printer. So, for example, I have a, a printer bot and I have a Creality. If I select the printer bot uh, profile and print on the uh, Creality, it might not work very well. Different parameters for turning heat on and off and, and things. The other interesting thing, too, is knowing what size your, your nozzle is and your filament. There are different sizes, nozzles, different filaments. I use 175 millimeter and a four millimeter nozzle. I once sliced a model for the wrong filament by accident. I ended up with like spaghetti. It was like throwing out bits of plastic. Ah, terrible. Um, computer gets hung during printing if you're using your computer. Like I said, don't do any firmware updates or whatever. Also, you might want to put your computer on a UPS in case you have one of our wonderful PG&E power fluctuations. Um, mechanical failures I talked about. Oh, running out of filament. That's always a fun thing to do. There's nothing like being into four hours of a print and seeing the last two centimeters of your filament disappearing down the hole. And, you know, you've still got six, seven percent more to go. So that's why I have these, these things I've learned over the years. Now, one of the problems that you're all going to have when you first start is I call it stiction or the lack of. You've got to get your model to stick to the print surface. Um, one reason that I, I went off using ABS is that you need to have the bed heated all the time and you, you, you had to use some special tape or some special slurry like a hairspray and oh, and I didn't like it. And so I don't use that anymore. But still, you've got, even with PLA, you've got to get your bed level. Um, and here's an example of, of what happens if you don't get that first layer right. As, as, as we told and explained, you, you move in the X, Y direction. So you can see it kind of drew a box and then it, it did a zigzag fill pattern. And then all of a sudden, there's a blob of plastic and, and no, more, uh, no more pattern whatsoever. And that's because it didn't stick at all. Okay. It, well, it started, to, it thought it was sticking and then it lifted. And this, um, this is a printer bot machine and they use some special blue tape to put down there. I, I haven't seen it since printer bot disappeared, but I'm sure you can buy it somewhere on, on eBay. This is a close up looking at the layer. This, by the way, that's just the, uh, this printer used to do a brim round before it started to, to do the model. And again, the, the idea is so that you can see that it's going to print. And if you look on the left hand side, it's still not quite good. There's a, that circle area at the top, uh, top there shows that it was just not quite right. It was too blobby. But if you look then at the uh, right hand side, that's kind of a, a pretty good first layer. And that's a three, a three millimeter uh, 
square I make. And in other words, when I'm testing the printer and I'm setting up, I have a standard three millimeter design um, that I print. And if I, if I can print that and it sticks and it looks good, then I know I can go and start the, the next model. Now, some printers have a uh, self-leveling mechanism. At the side, the printer bot did, for example, at the side of it, it has a metal detector, basically. And they go down and you, you still got to set it up to the right offset. But once you've set it off, uh, once you've got that offset correct, the printer should always then print level. In other words, as the print head comes down, it knows that it should be 0.2 millimeters across and, and go up. And so other ones you print by hand, you level by hand. And that's usually four knurled knobs underneath the print plate. And you've got to adjust them and there's alignments for it. And uh, as I said, I did a, a big print for my son uh, while he was here in summer. And then I was doing some printing afterwards and for some reason, my bed wasn't level anymore. And it's because I have a granddaughter who was sat watching it. And you know what grandchildren are like? She found these little knobs you could like twiddle. So it took me a day to, to reset that one up. So again, trying to get this, this first level, we call it Goldilocks. So this is a presentation of the printer bed and the, the, the extruder or the hot end and how to get that perfect bead. And uh, you want to make sure that you know, it's, there's just that gap that it can squirt plastic out and make it stick against the base. That's going to be one of, once you've got that down, you, you're probably fine. Ah, once again, the, the two different printers, mine on the, uh, the, the left, you can see the knobs underneath. If you look carefully, you'll see those big two front knobs. Uh, there's two at the back as well that level that bed. This bed, by the way, is glass. And so I don't need to put any sticky tape on there or special glue. The, uh, the glass is, it's been really good since I've, I've used it. I do have a scratch on it because as I said, uh, the micro switch there on the left hand side, I didn't tighten fully when I built this printer and that's the Z end stop. Well, it came down and it knocked that micro switch just slightly down. So the next time it came down, it kind of put the brass nozzle into the glass and made a, a nice little scratch but anyway we fixed it um the, the one on the right there that's this new uh, same company but this is the resin printer and there's some good articles on the web there's a good video on the web of a guy using one and showing you all the dangers of the chemicals and to me that's too messy and i don't need to print that fine but again it depends what you guys you know what what you want to print and how you want to print um a quick comparison between the two um the plastic eye print PLA is about $25 a kilogram. Um, you can pay more for carbon fiber and the other things. You don't really need any special handling. You need to keep it dry. Um, you can sandpaper it. It's a slow printer. And um, compared to the other one, you uh, need a bottles of resin at about $40 a kilogram a bottle. You need gloves and a face mask. You'll need a resin remover. You need ultraviolet light actually for finally curing the print. I forgot to mention that. So. Finally, when you get it out, you've removed the resin, you've got to put it in another box with another ultraviolet light for a while to, uh, to get it to cure. One, one person I saw on the web actually put it out in the sun because the sun is a source of ultraviolet, but it's got different rays. So when his model came back in, part of it was sunburnt because it got the wrong and it rays. Anyway, again, they, they're, they're about the same price now, but the... The FDA ones like mine, you get a bigger print area than you do for the SLA, one, uh, the resin one. A uh, couple of resources, but I, I sent Greg a list of resources that you might want to use. Uh, time for any questions, just a uh, summary. You model it, you come on with these software packages, you slice it, and oh, you print it. Okay, so any questions or I bored you all to tears or? Very good, Dave, appreciate it. We'll have the, um, uh, the, the, the resources when I uh, do the video, the part of the description will have those things listed there. Any quick questions? Nice job, thank you. Great presentation, Dave. Yes. You're welcome. 
Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Mr. Dunn. Brian, back to you.